I've seen the world on it all. Had my cake now. Diamonds, brilliant, in the air now. Hot summer nights with my when you and I were forever wild. Crazy days, silly nights when you. You seem to forget that I am married, and the one charm of marriage is that it makes love of deception absolutely necessary. I never know where my wife is, and my wife never knows what I am doing. I, mean, I hate the way you talk about your married life. I believe you are actually a very good husband, but you are thoroughly ashamed of your own virtues. You are an extraordinary fellow. You never say a moral thing, and you never do a wrong thing. Your cynicism is simply a pose. Being natural is simply a pose, my dear Basil, and the most annoying pose I know. But I'm afraid I must be going. But before I go, I insist you tell me why you won't exhibit Dorian Gray's picture. I want the real reason. I told you the real reason. No, you did not. You said that you would put too much of yourself in it. Now that is childish. The very portrait that is painted with me is a portrait of the artist, not the sitter. It is merely the accident, the occasion. It is not he who reveals himself on the picture, but rather the artist, who on the color canvas, who reveals himself. The reason I will not exhibit this picture, Harry, is that I am afraid I have shown it in a secret of my own. When I met Dorian Gray for the first time, I knew I could come face to face with someone whose mere personality is so fascinating. If I allow it, Oh, my very heart itself. I've always been my own. 
never cared for anything but your art. It is all my art now. He is much more to me than a model or a sitter. I won't tell you that I'm not satisfied with what I did. All that is beauty is such that art cannot express. There is nothing that art can express, Heidi. And I know the work I've done to find mentor and pray is good work. The best work of my life. You would understand. You would like everybody. <laughs> that is to say you are indifferent toward anyone. Oh, but I do understand, Basil. This is extraordinary. I must meet Dorian Gray. I don't want you to meet him. But why not? You have a bad influence on impressionable people. Mr. Dorian Gray is here, sir, to pose for your portrait. Let me in. You mustn't keep him waiting. <coughs> Basil, but I am afraid I must go. I've already promised to meet a man at the Orleans. Goodbye, Mr. Gray. Come visit me at my estate some afternoon. I'm nearly always there at five o'clock. Write to me when you are coming. I should be sorry to miss you. Basil, if Lord Henry goes, then I shall go too. You never open your lips while you are painting in this horribly dull staring on the platform trying to be pleasant. Ask him to stay. Stay, Harry. To oblige Dorian and to oblige myself. It's true, I never speak while I am working and I never listen either. It must be dreadfully tedious with my unfortunate subjects. I beg you to say. But what about my man at the Orleans? I don't think there will be any difficulty in that. You are always ruining your engagements. Sit down, Harry. Now, Dorian. Step back up on the platform and try not to move around so much. Nor should you listen to what Harry has to say. He has a bad influence over all of our friends, with the single exception of myself. Lord Henry, do you really have as bad as an influence as Basil says? There is no such thing as good influence, Mr. Gray. All influence is immoral. How so? Because to influence a person is to give him one's own soul. He does not think his natural thoughts or burn with his natural passions. His virtues are not real to him. His sins, if there are such things as sins, are borrowed. He becomes an echo of someone else's music, an actor for a part that has not been made for him. The aim of life is self-development, to realize one's own nature perfectly. That is what we are all here for. Turn your head a little more to the right, Dorian. <laughs> I believe that if one man were to live out his life fully and completely, giving form to every feeling, expression to every thought, reality to every dream, 
I believe that the world would gain such a fresh impulse of joy that we would forget all of life's maladies. But the bravest man among us is afraid of himself. We are punished for our refusals. Every, every impulse that we strive to strangle broods in our minds and poisons us. You, Mr. Gray, with your rose-red youth and your rose-white boyhood, you have had thoughts that have made you afraid. Dreams whose mere memory might stain your cheek with shame. Madam, I am tired of any moment to rest. The air is going so stifling in here. Well, I'm so sorry. When I am working, I can't seem to think of anything else. But don't worry, I've never posed better. You are perfectly still, and I've caught the effect I want. You may rest now, Dorian. I can finish the rest on my own. You are perfectly right not to tire yourself. You must preserve your marvelous youth. It is, after all, the one thing worth having. I don't feel that way. No, you don't feel it. But you will someday. When you are old and wrinkled and ugly. When thought has seared your forehead with its lines and passion branded your lips with its hideous fires. You will feel it. You will feel it terribly. Now you charm the world wherever you go. But will it always be so? You have a wonderfully beautiful face, Mr. Gray, and beauty is a form of genius. It is higher, in fact, than genius, as it needs no explanation. It is of the great facts of the world, like sunlight or springtime. <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> when you have lost it, you won't laugh. Yes, Mr. Gray, the gods have been good to you, but what the gods give, they quickly take away. Time is jealous of you, and it will make you shallow, and hollow-cheeked, and dull-eyed. Realize your youth while you still have it. Don't squander the gold of your days listening to the tedious, trying to improve the hopeless failure, or giving your life away to the common and the vulgar. Live! Live the wonderful life that is in you. Let nothing be lost upon you. Be always searching for new sensations. Be afraid of nothing. When I first saw you, I saw that you were quite unconscious of what you really are, of what you really might be. I thought how tragic it would be if you were wasted. But there is such a little time that our youth will last. Such a little time. And we never gain back our youth. We merely degenerate into hideous puppies. Haunted by the passions of the things that we were too much afraid, and the exquisite temptations that we had not the courage to yield to you. It's finished. It is quite finished at last. My dear friend, I congratulate you. It is the best picture of modern times. What do you think, Mr. Gray? Well, do you like it? Well, of course he likes it. It is the best thing in modern art. I will give you anything you ask for, Basil. I must have it. It's not mine to give. It's Dorian's. Well, Dorian is a lucky fellow. How sad it is. I shall grow old, hideous, and dreadful. But this portrait will remain always young. It will never be older than it is today. Won't it the other way around? For were I to remain always young, and for this portrait to grow old in my stead, well, for that, <laughs> for that, I would give everything. There's nothing in the whole world I would not give. I would give my very soul for that. You would hardly care for an arrangement like that, that's Oh, I would strongly object, Harry. I believe you would. You like your art better than you like your friends. I'm nothing more to you than your statuettes, I dare say. Sorry, that's it's quite unlike you to say. What's the matter? Nothing's the matter, Basil. I merely had my eyes open, is all. I'm nothing more to you than your ivory hermits or your silver form. You will like them always. How long do you think you will like me, Bobby? Hmm? Till I 
Have my first wrinkle, I suppose. I know now that whenever one loses one's good looks, whatever that may be, one loses everything. Your portrait is top of And Lord Henry is perfectly right. Youth is the only thing worth having. When I find that I'm growing old, I shall kill myself. Florian, don't say things like that. I have never had such a friend like you, and I shall never have such another. You are not jealous of material things, are you? You are more finer than any of them. I am jealous of this portrait you painted me. Why did you paint it, Father? It will mark me someday. Mark me horribly. This is your doing. It is not. It is simply the real Dorian Gray. You should have left when I asked you to. I say when you asked me. Harry, I can't quarrel with two of my best friends at once. Between you two, you made me hate the best thing I've ever done. And I will destroy it. But it's about paint on canvas anyway. I won't let it come between our three lives and mar them out. Don't! Don't do it, brother! It would be murder! is the thief of time. Don't try to be charming, Harry. I'm not in the mood. Now, Gloria will be joining us tonight. I hardly see him anymore. He used to visit me every day. And I met you. I love to see him once a week. It is us that will be joining him. Haven't you heard the news? No, what is it? Political, I hope. Politics is me. There's not one person in the House of Commons worth painting. But some of the good stories. 
Not at all. It is about Dorian himself. He is engaged to be married. Dorian is engaged to be married. Possibly. Believe it. He is engaged to an actress. No, that can't be right. Dorian is far too sensible. Dorian is far too wise not to do foolish things now and then, my dear Basil. Marriage is hardly a thing one does now and then, Harry. Except in America. But I didn't say that he was married. I said that he was engaged to be married. There is a great difference. Think of Dorian's birth, his position, his wealth. It would be absurd for him to marry so much beneath him. If you want to make him marry this girl, tell him so, Basil. He is sure to do it then. If you still don't believe me, you can read it here yourself. <laughs> he wrote this letter to me earlier this morning. I told him to meet us here so he could have the pleasure of telling us himself. It reads, My dearest Lord Henry, I am engaged to Sybil Vane. Hidden behind garden labels, a vulgar drop set in hideous curtains was Romeo and Juliet. There was a dreadful orchestra presented over by a young man that sat at a cracked piano that nearly drove me away. Romeo was a stout elderly gentleman with corked eyebrows, a husky tragedy voice, and a figure like a beer man. He was as grotesque as the scenery, and that looked as if it had come out of a countryside boot. But Juliet, a imagine her own probably seventeen years of age with a little flower-like face, a small, brief head with little corners of dark brown hair, eyes that were wells of passion, and lips like the petals of a rose. She was the loveliest thing I'd ever seen in my life. If I would see this girl for the mist of tears that came across me, now. After night, I go to see her perform. I have seen her die in the glooms of an Italian tomb, sucking and poison from her lover's lips. I have seen her wandering through the forest of Arden, disguised as a pretty boy in clothes and desert and dainty cap. I have seen her in every age and in every costume. And I am in love with an actress. I I hope the girl is good. I don't want him to marry someone vile and degrading that might ruin his intellect or his nature. Then you should have never introduced him to me. <laughs> but she is better than good. Dorian says that she is beautiful, and he is not often wrong about things of that kind. We need to meet her tonight if that boy doesn't forget his engagements. And do you approve of this, Harry? Well, surely you can. There's some silly infatuation. I never approve or disapprove of anything nowadays. Dorian falls in love with a girl who acts the part of Juliet and proposes to marry her. Why not? It would make him nonetheless interesting. You know that I am not a champion of marriage. Marriage makes one unselfish, and unselfish people are colorless and lacking in individuality. Still, every experience is of value, and no matter what one can say against marriage, it certainly is an experience. I hope that Dorian will marry this girl, passionately adore her for six months, and then suddenly become interested in someone else. You would make a wonderful son. You don't mean a single word of that, Harry. You know you don't. <coughs> Dorian Gray's life was soiled. No one would be sorry <coughs> than yourself. You are much better than pretending. You think too highly of me. Ah, but here is Dorian himself. He will tell you more than I can. My dear Henry, my dear Basil, you must both congratulate me. Dorian, I hope you are always this happy. However, I won't forgive you for not letting me know of your engagement. You let Harry know. And I don't forgive you for being late to dinner. <laughs> but come, let us sit down. You can tell us how it all came about. There is really not much to tell. What happened is simply this. After I left you yesterday evening, Henry, I went down to the theatre around 8 o'clock. Sybil was heading Rosalind. Of course, the scenery was dreadful and the music absurd. But Sybil, you should have seen her. When she came on stage in the pretty boy costume, I thought her perfectly wonderful. As for her acting, though, you shall see her tonight. I sat in the dingy box absolutely wrong. After the performance was over, I went behind the 
have to speak to him. And as we were sitting there, then, came this look across her eye. The look I had never seen there before. My lips moved towards hers. We kissed each other. I can't describe to you exactly what I felt in that moment, but it seems as if my entire life led up to one perfect point of rose colored joy. I've been right, Basil Hunter, to take my love of poetry and to find my wife in Shakespeare's place. Lips that Shakespeare have taught to speak and whisper their secret in my head. I've had the arms frozen in around me and the lips truly at the moment. Yes, Gloria, I suppose you were right. But at what particular point did you mention the word marriage? And what did she say in answer? My dear Henry, I did not treat to some business transaction, nor did I make any formal proposal. I simply told her I loved her. But she said she was not worthy to be my wife. Not worthy! Can you believe that? Well, the whole world is nothing to me compared to her. I see. Women are wonderfully practical. In situations of that kind, we often forget to say anything about marriage, and they often remind us. Don't, Harry. You no know important. Dorian is not like other men. He would never bring misery upon anyone. Nature is too kind for that. Henry, you are quite incorrigible. But I don't mind. It is impossible to be upset with you. When you see Sybil, you will feel that. The man who could wrong her is a beast, a beast without a heart. I don't understand how anyone could wish to harm the thing he loves. I love Sybil Bay. I wish to put her on a pedestal of gold and to see the world worship the woman who is mine. When I look at her, I forget you and all your poisons, fascinating, wrong, yet delightful theories. I'm afraid I cannot claim my theories as my own. They belong to nature, not to me. When we are good, we are always happy. But when we are happy, we are not always good. Ah, Harry, but what do you mean by good? Well, to put it plainly, to be good is to be in harmony with oneself. Discord is to be placed into harmony with others. Surely. One lives merely for oneself. One must pay a terrible price for doing so. Yes, we are overcharged for everything now, at least. But, but surely one has to pay in more ways than just money. That's quite true, Dorian. Nothing is ever quite true. But that goes double for the things you say, Henry. I don't know why I like you so much. You will always like me, Dorian. I represent to you all the sins you have never had the courage to commit. <laughs> what nonsense! Now, it's time to go to the theatre. I assure you, when you see Sybil Bain, she will represent to you something you've never known. I have known everything, Dorian. But I'm always ready for a new emotion. I fear for me, however, there is no such thing. Still, your wonderful girl might thrill me yet. Let us go. I shall go with you. <coughs> I'm sorry, Basil. There's only room enough for two in the carriage. You must follow behind in a hansom.
say something to your patients for me, sister. Well, you don't like being kissed, Jim. You're a dreadful old dad. I want to walk you to the theatre tonight, Sybil. I will be leaving for Australia tonight, and I wish to see you all before I go. I don't suppose I shall ever see this over at London again, and I'm sure I don't want to. My son, don't say such dreadful things. Why not, Mother? I mean it. as you're in love.
place to find one's divinity in. She is to find beyond all living things. When she acts, you will forget everything. These common, rough people <coughs> with their coarse faces and brutal gestures. Is it quiet when she is on stage? They sit quietly and watch. They weep and laugh as she wills them to. She makes them responsive to violence. She spiritualizes them. One feels as though they are the same flesh and blood as oneself. The same flesh and blood as oneself. Oh, I hope not. Don't pay attention to him, Dorian. I understand what you mean. And I believe in this girl. Anyone you love must be wonderful. And if this girl has the effect you describe, then she must be fine and noble. If this girl can bring a soul to those who have lived with that one, and bring a sense of beauty to those whose lives have been soared and ugly, then she is worthy of all your admiration. This man is quite right. I did not think so at first, but I admit now. The gods have made civil vain for you, and without her, you would have been incomplete. Thank you, Father. I knew you would understand. Henry is so cynical and terrified of you. Ah, let's hear it to the orchestra. Let's begin.
Well, you should have understood. You understand now, don't you? Understand what? Why I was so bad? Why I will always be bad? Why I will never act well again? You are ill, I suppose. You shouldn't act when you are ill. You make yourself ridiculous. My friend was born. I was born. Florian, before I knew you, acting was the one reality of my life. I thought it were all true. The joys of Beatrice were my joys, and the sorrows of Cordelia were mine also. The common people that acted with me seemed to be godlike, and the painted scenery was my world. And then you painted oh, my beautiful love, and you freed my soul from prison. You taught me what reality really is. Tonight, the first time in my life, I saw through through the hollowness and through the sham and through the silliness of the empty pageant in which I had always played. Tonight, for the first time, I realized that Romeo was old and hideous and painted, and that, that the moonlight in the orchard was false and that the scenery was vulgar, and that the words that I had to say were not my words, were not what I wanted to say. You brought me something so much higher Something where all art is but a reflection. I may mimic the passion that I do not feel. I cannot mimic one that burns me like fire, and you have made me see it. You have killed my life. What? Yes. You have killed my love. You used to serve my imagination, now you don't even serve my curiosity. I loved you because you were marvelous, because you had genius and intellect, because you realized the dreams of great poets who brought shape and substance to the shadows of art. You're thrown it all away! You are shallow and stupid! My God, how bad I was to love you! What a fool I have been! You are nothing to me now. I will never speak to you again. I will never see you. I will never mention your name. I don't know what you were to me once. Why once? Oh, I can't bear to think of it! I was out of the eyes of you! You have spoiled the romance of my life. And how is it you can know a love that you say it mars your art? Without your art, you are nothing. I would have made you famous, splendid, magnificent!
make the No change to the painting itself, and yet I can swear the image is an altar. I have no such line by my lips. What could it mean? When Basil painted this, I made a wish. It was just a mad fancy, but yes, I remember. I wish to remain always young and for this portrait to grow old in my step. <clears throat> no, I must be imagining that such things are not possible. And yet I can swear this image looks cruel. Have I been cruel? No, it was Sybil's fault, not mine. She was shallow and unworthy. Though it was callous of me to treat her like that. No. No, I did suffer. Through three hours of that play, I lived through centuries of shame. No, you can't have changed. It's Folly to think so. So, change or not, I must take this painting to the side. This, this portrait is a symbol of my conscience. I must resist temptation and I must stop seeing Lord Henry, or at the very least stop listening to those poisonous theories of his. I must, yes, I must go back to Civil Bay and make amends. The poor thing has suffered worse than I have. And I have a duty to her. <laughs> yes, Civil will be my salvation. And that hideous look will be gone from your face after a good night's sleep. Symbol of the degradation of sin. 
That makes it all the more important to make a man to sit. Dorian, it's Henry. Open up. My dear boy, I must see you. I can't bear to see you shutting yourself up like this. Let me in at once. I am so sorry for what you must be going through. But you must not think too much about it. <laughs> you mean about Sybil Bay? Yes, of course. It is dreadful from one point of view, but it was not your fault. Now tell me, did you go behind and see her after the show's over? Yes. I felt sure you had. Did you make a scene with her? Oh, Henry. I was brutal. Perfectly brutal. But it is all right. I am not sorry for anything that has happened. It has taught me to know myself better. Ah, oh, Dorian, I'm so glad to hear you say that. I was afraid I'd find you here plunged in remorse and tearing away that nice hair of yours. I have gone through all of that, Henry, but I am happy now. Besides, to Settle my conscience over it. I'm going to go back and make amends and marry Sybil Vane. Marry Sybil Vane? But my dear Dory. Yes, Henry. I know you are going to say something dreadful about marriage, but don't say it. Don't say things of that kind to me ever again. Two days ago, I asked Sybil to marry me. She is to be my wife. I'm not going to break my word. Dorian, didn't you get my letter to you? I had it sent this morning by my best servant. I am sure I have received it, but I get to go through any of my mail today. Then, you know nothing. What is that to know? Sybil Bain is dead. Dead? Sybil. Dad, no, it's just terrible. How dare you say something like that? It is true. It is in all the morning papers. I wrote to you to ask you not to tell anyone until I came. There will be an inquest, of course. And you must not be mixed up in it. I suppose they didn't know your name at the theatre. If they didn't, then it is all right. Did anyone ever see you going round to her room? Henry, did you say an inquest? My God! I can't bear to be quick to leave everything at once! It was not an accident, Dory. But we must make sure that the public sees it that way. It seems when she was leaving the theater around 12 o'clock or so with her mother that she said she had forgotten something upstairs and went to fetch it. She did not come down again inevitably. They found her lying dead on the floor of her dressing room. She had swallowed something poisonous. By mistake, of course. I don't know what it was, but it had either acid or white lead in it. I should fancy it was acid that she seems to have died instantaneously. Henry, that is terrible! Yes, it is dreadful, but you must not think about it too much. I saw in the paper that she was 17. I should have thought she were almost younger. She seemed such a child and seemed to know so little about acting. Dorian, you mustn't let this thing get on your nerves. How could I not? I have murdered Sybil Bay. Murdered her as soon as I cut her little throat with a knife. Oh, Henry. You don't know what she was to me once. Then came that dreadful night. It was really only last night in which she performed so badly, my heart almost broke. I went behind and spoke to her, and she explained it all to me. I thought it pathetic. I was not moved a bit. I thought her shallow. But I told myself that I would go back and marry her and now. And now she is dead, my God, my God! Do you have any idea the trouble I'm in? She was supposed to keep me straight. She was supposed to reform me. She had no right to kill herself. And it was, it was selfish about it. Dorian, 
the only way that a woman can ever truly reform a man is by boring him so completely that he loses all interest in life. If you had married this girl, you would have been wretched. But I thought it was my duty to her. Well, it is not my fault that this terrible tragedy has prevented my doing what was right. I remember your saying once about good resolutions, that there is a certain fatality to them, that they always happen too late. Mine certainly were. Henry, why is it I cannot feel as bad about this tragedy as I want to? I don't think I'm heartless, do you? Not at all. I fancy that the true explanation is this. It often happens that the real tragedies of the world take place in such an inartistic manner that they hurt us with their crude violence. Sometimes, however, a tragedy that possesses artistic elements of beauty crosses our lives, and the whole thing simply appeals to our sense of dramatic effect. In the present case, someone has killed herself of a love of you. I wish that I ever had such an experience. It would have made me in love with love for the rest of my life. How different Sybil Vane must be from all the women one meets. There is something truly beautiful about her death. I am glad to see that in this century such wonders still happen. But I was terribly cruel to her, you forget that. I am sure you were absolutely splendid. And besides, I've never seen you really and truly angry, but I can fancy how delightful you looked. And after all, you said to me something the day before yesterday that seemed to me at the time to be merely fanciful. But now I see is absolutely true. What was that? You said that Sybil Vane represented to you all the heroines of romance. That if she were Desdemona one night, she were Ophelia the other. That if she died as Juliet, she came to life as Imogen. But she will never come to life again now. No. She will never come to life. She has played her last part. But you must think of that lonely death in that tawdry dressing room as simply a strange fragment from a tragedy. The girl never really lived. And so she never really died. To you, at least, she was always a phantom. A ghost that flitted through Shakespeare's plays and left them lovelier for her presence. But the moment she touched actual life, she marred it. And it marred her. And so she passed away. Mourn for Ophelia, if you like. Put ashes on your head because Cordelia was strangled. Cry out against heaven because the daughter of Brabantio died. But do not waste your tears over Sybil Bane. She was less real than they are. Explain me to myself, Henry. I felt everything that you have said. I was afraid that I could not express it to myself. How well you know me. But come, we must not talk again of what has happened. It has been a marvelous experience, but that is all. I wonder if life still has in store for me anything else is marvelous. Life has everything in store for me, Gloria. There is nothing that you, with your extraordinary good looks, will not be able to accomplish. You certainly are my best friend, Henry. No one understands me quite like you do. We are only at the beginning of our friendship. I shall be at the opera tonight. I trust you'll be able to join me. I will see you there. I told you I would meet you at the opera, Henry. Surely, whatever it is, can wait until then. It's not hard, Dorian. Basil. Victor! 
Get the door. <laughs> My apologies, Basil. Lord Henry was just here. I must have just missed it. May I come in? Certainly. Now, to what do I owe the pleasure? I'm so glad I found you. Going myself, but I was afraid of intruding upon a sorrow I could not let. Oh, that poor woman. What a state she must be in. And her only child, too. What did she say about this whole thing? My dear Basil, how would I know? I have not been to the theatre since that dreadful performance, and I have absolutely no intention of going there again. I may note, however, that she was not the woman's only child. No, she has a son. A charming fellow, I believe. But he is not on the stage, you know. He is a sailor or something. Now, I am going to the opera. You should join me and forget about the whole business. I have had his performing tonight, and her singing is divine. The opera? You are going to the opera while Sybil Vane lies dead in some sore lodging. You can talk of other women being charming and a patty speaking divinely, but for the girl you love even has the quiet of a grave to sleep in? Oh, why, man, there are horrors in store for that cold little body of hers. Stop, Basil. Don't talk about such dreadful subjects. If one doesn't talk about such things, it's as if they never happened. What's done is done. What's past is past. Oh, yesterday, the past. Now, well, what has the actual lapse of time got to do with it, Basil? <clears throat> It is only a sentimentalist who requires years to get rid of an emotion. A man who is a master of himself can get rid of a sorrow as easily as he can invent a pleasure. I don't want to be at the mercy of my emotions, Basil. I want to use them, to enjoy them, and to dominate them. Dorinda's is horrible. Something's changed. You look the exact same wonderful boy who day after day would come to my studio to sit for this picture. But you were simple, you were natural. You were the most unspoiled creature I've ever known. Now I don't know what's going on. You speak as if you have no heart, no soul in you whatsoever. It's all hell you said, because I know that much. I owe more to Henry than I do to you, Basil. You only taught me to be vain. Well, Dorian, I am to be punished for that. I will be someday. Um, what do you want, Basil? I want the joy and gray eyes. Well, you came too late. When I heard that Sybil killed herself... Killed herself? My God, is there no doubt about that? My dear Basil, surely you didn't think it was some vulgar accident. Of course she killed herself. How fearful. No. There is nothing fearful about it. It is one of the great romantic tragedies of the age. As a rule, people who act lead the most commonplace lives. How different Sybil was. She lived her finest tragedy. She was always a heroine. The night she performed last, the night you saw her, she acted badly because she knew the reality of love. When she knew its unreality, she died. She passed again into the sphere of art. Her death was all the pathetic uselessness of martyrdom, all its wasted beauty. But as I was saying, you must not think I have not suffered. Even Lord Henry, who first brought me the news, in fact, had no idea what I was doing. I suffered immensely. And then it passed away. I cannot repeat an emotion, Basil. No one can, except sentimentalists. And I know you are surprised at me talking to you like this, but you have not realized how much I have developed. I was just a schoolboy when you knew me. I'm a man. I have new ideas, new thoughts, new passions. 
I am different, but you must not like me less, Basil. I am changed, but you must always be my friend. Of course, I am very fond of Henry, but I know you are better. You are not stronger. No, you are much too afraid of life, but you are better. And how happy we used to be together, Basil. Don't leave me, and don't quarrel with me. I am what I am. There is nothing more to be said. Well, Dorian, I won't speak to you this horrible thing that has been. I only hope your name won't come in connection to it. The inquest take place today. Have they summoned you? No, they don't know my name. But surely she did. Yes, but I'm quite certain she never told anyone in. She told me once that they were all rather curious to learn who I was, and she invariably told them my name was Prince John. It was pretty nice. Basil, you must do me a drawing of her. I would like more to remember her by than memories of a few kisses or some broken, pathetic words. I'll do what I can for you. But you must come and sit for yourself again. I can't go on without you. I did, Basil. I could never sit for you again. It's impossible. Yeah, boy, what nonsense. Do you mean to say you don't like what I did of you? Where is it? Why have you covered it up? Do draw the curtains, Dorian. It is the best work I've ever done. How shameful of your servant to hide my work like this. I knew the room was different when I came in. My son? Surely you don't imagine I let him arrange my room for me, do you? No, he set up my flowers for me sometimes, that is all. No, I did it myself. The light was too strong. Too the strong nonsense, boy. It is an admirable place for it. Let me look at it. No, Pastor, you must not look at it. I don't wish you to. Not look at my own work? How absurd! Surely you can't be serious. Basil, you look at this painting. I will never talk to you again. I'm not to offer you an explanation, nor are you to ask for one. But remember, Basil, you look at this painting, everything is over between us. Dorian, what's the matter? Of course I won't look at it if you don't want me to. But it is rather absurd not to look at my own work, especially if I'm going to exhibit it in the autumn. To exhibit it? You want to exhibit it? Of course! All of my best work are going to be exhibited in the first week of October. Watch would only be away for a month. I suppose you could easily spare it for that time. In fact, you are sure to be out of town, and if you keep it covered up all the time, you can't care much about it. Basil, you assured me most solemnly that nothing in the world would induce you to send this painting to any exhibition. You told Lord Henry exactly the same thing! Basil, each of us have a secret, don't we? You tell me yours, and I'll tell you mine. What was your reasoning for refusing to exhibit my picture? Dorian, if I told you, you liked me less, you would certainly laugh at me, and I cannot have you doing either of those two. If you wish me never to look at this picture, I am content. I've always you to look at. If you wish me to hide the best thing I've ever done from this world, then I am satisfied. Your friendship means much more to you than anything or reputation. No, Basil. You must tell me. I think I have a right to know. Sit down, Dora. Answer me one question. Did you see something in the pitch? Something curious? Something that did not reveal itself at first, but suddenly? Yes, <laughs> that it did. Don't speak. Wait till you hear what I have to say. Dorian from 
the moment I met you, your personality had the most extraordinary influence on me. I was dominated. I worshipped you. I grew jealous of whomever you spoke to. But when I drew all to myself, I was only happy when you were around. When you were away, you were in the presence of my heart. Of course, I never told you this. You wouldn't understand. I hardly understand it myself. All I know, Jordan, is that I have seen perfection face to face. And the world has become more wonderful. My method or the mere wonder of your personality, I cannot tell you. All I know is, is I worked on it. Every film and inch of color seemed to reveal my secret. I was afraid people would know my idolatry. I felt wrong. I had talked too much. I had put too much of myself into this picture. So I resolved never to exhibit it. After a few days, the thing left my studio, and as soon as I got rid of it, I thought myself foolish into thinking I saw anything else other than you were extremely good looking and that I can paint. So when I got this art from Paris, I determined to make your portrait a principle of my exhibition. But not thinking of Jeff. I see now that you are right. I saw something in it, Basil. Something bad and curious. Well, you don't mind my looking at the thing now, do you? But Basil, you cannot pass when you ask me that. I don't wish you to no, say. No, you can't.
who is responsible for this? I, I don't know. They suspect it was the gentleman who always wanted to see her. What was his name? Nobody knew his real name. She only referred to him as Prince Charming. Tearing or 
misunderstanding. I have created you, and it appears only your creator to witness you. But I didn't create you at all, did I? No, you are as much thousands of masterpieces as you are mine. I should show you to him. He deserves to know what has become of his greatest one. Yes, I must reconnect with him. It's only been 20 years. Oh, I'm sure he'll come when I beckon him. and brains for every common tongue to wag against him. And these people who pose as being moral, what sort of lives do they leave themselves? You forget, my dear fellow, we are in the native land of the hypocrite. Tori, that is not a question. I know England is bad. English society is no better. That is why I want you to be fine. But you have not been fine. One has the right to judge a man by the effects he has over his friends. And you all seem to lose all sense of goodness. You fill them up with a madness for pleasure. They've gone down to the depths and you led them there. Yes, you led them there, and yet you can smile as you're smiling now. And there is worse behind. I know you and Harry are inseparable. If not for that reason, you would not have made your sister's name an insult. Careful, Basil. No, Dorian. I must. 
speaking, you must listen. When you met Lady Gwendolyn, not a breath of scandal ever touched her name. Is there a single decent woman in London who would dare take a drive with her to the park? It threatens what little respect I have for you, Dorian. Don't shrug your shoulders. Don't be so indifferent, Dorian. You have a wonderful influence. Use it for good, not for evil. They say you corrupt everyone with whom you become intimate with. And that it's sufficient for you to enter a house for shame to follow after. I don't know if that is certain. At one point, I knew for certain it was false. But that was what I knew you, Dorian. I wonder now if I know you still. Before I should ask that, I should have to look at your soul. Oh, God, that. Oh, my dear Basil, you shall see it tonight. It is your greatest handiwork after all. Why shouldn't you see it? You can tell the world all about it afterwards if you like. No one would believe you. And even if they did, they would like you all the better for it. You prattle about the age so tediously, but I know it better than you do. You have talked enough about corruption. Now it is time for you to see it face to face. I shall show you my soul. The thing you fancy only God can see. That's blasphemy, Dorian. You mustn't say things like that. They don't mean anything. Oh, you. but they do. You think it is only God who can see the soul? Pull back those curtains and you shall see mine. Oh, lad, Dorian. You refuse? Very well. Then I will do it myself. It is your greatest work, after all. 
Oh, but you've had your masterpiece, so I will have mine. I will have mine! given up our belief in the sun, so sin cannot touch us. It certainly cannot touch you, Dory. You have never looked more charming than you do tonight. You remind me of the day I saw you first. You were rather cheeky, very shy, and absolutely extraordinary. You have changed, of course, but not in appearance. What a blessing it is that there is one art left to us that is not imitative. You have led an exquisite life, and have drunk deeply of everything. You have crushed the grapes against your palate. Nothing has been hidden from you, and it has all been to you no more than the sound of music. Your life has not marred you, and this will not mar you. You are still the same. I am not the same! Yes, you are the same. Don't spoil your life by renouncing your sins and playing it honesty. At present, you are a perfect type. Don't make yourself incomplete. You need not shake your head. You know you are. The world has cried out against us both, but it has always worshipped you. It will always worship you. You are what the age is searching for and what it is afraid it has found. I, I am different. I will sin no more. I will change! As long as you are Dorian Gray, you will do no such thing. You forget how well I know you. You forget that I am you. And more real than you've ever been, Dorian. You are incomplete without your sin. I... I am. I have done what I have always done and always will do. I've had an experience of the rarest kindness. It was just a fancy, fancy that I could that I could be anything else. Your experience has made you praised, Dorian. No man is safe from the actions and consequences. Not even a man such as you. You must change your ways. There is hope yet without this painting. There is nothing without this painting. No real man puts about the trousers and tied. You are no longer a real man, Dorian. You have broken the laws of nature and have ruined your humanity. You must change your ways or forever suffer the consequences. Huh. Beauty lies beyond one space, Dorian. If you were to just separate yourself from the idolatry of this image, then you too can be saved. You know you doubt this way of life. You have goodness in you yet, I've seen it. Now you must see it within yourself. How can a man possibly profit if he gains the world and loses his soul? You can possibly find what he's looking for, Dorian. When you look upon my face, all you can do is wrench. You are disgusted and right for yourself, for you have become disgusted and vile. And there's nothing you can do about it. Don't listen to the specters of your past. They are nothing but figments of your imagination. I am the only thing that is real. Can they feel? Those pale, silent people we call the dead. Can they truly feel or know or listen? Of course not. But I can. Now listen to yourself, Dorian. Listen to me. Every year, every month almost, men are strangled in England for what you've done. You must destroy the body and hide the evidence. Basil was a very, very popular. He was not clever enough to have enemies, 
So why should I even believe that he's been murdered? No one can believe that he had come to such a really romantic end as he did. He shall say that he fell into the sin of the unrest. The conductor hushed it all. If you find a mortician or a chemist to help destroy any trace of him, no one will be the wiser for it. Yes. Yes, as far as anyone's concerned, Basil Howard left the house at 11. My servants are at Selma Royal and my valet has already gone to bed.
why man, it's now 18 years since Prince Charmin's made me what I am. You lie. Oh God, I'm telling the truth. I'm blood. Strike me down if it ain't so. Ask anyone around here. Do I embrace the worst one that comes here? They say he came to the dump for a great face. It's now 18 years since I met him. He hasn't changed much since then. I have the... So, Dorian Gray is his name. You swear what you say is true? I swear. Don't give me away to him. I'm afraid of him. Instead, why don't you come on back with me and let me show you what I learned from him. <laughs> your house again, Ray. But you said it was a matter of life and death. Yes, a matter of life and death, and, and more than one person. Come, sit down. Alan, in a locked room at the top of the stairs, a room to which nobody but myself has access, a dead man is seated at a table. He's been dead eight hours now. Don't stir and don't look at me like that. Who he is, how he died, why he died are matters that do not concern you. All I need you to do is stop, Greg. I don't want to know anything further. Whether what you have told me is true or not true does not concern me. Keep your horrible secrets to yourself. They interest me no longer. Helen, but this one will have to interest you. I am awfully sorry for you, but I have no other choice. You are the one man who is able to save me. You know about chemistry and things like that. You've done experiments. You, Alan, you are scientific. All I ask of you is to destroy the thing that was upstairs, to, to change it so that not a vestige of it will be left. Nobody saw this man come into my house. Indeed, at the present moment, he's supposed to be in Paris. He will not be missed for months, Alan. When he eventually is missed, however, you and you must change him into everything that belongs to him into a handful of ashes that I may scatter to the end. You are mad, Dorian. That was way too to call me for You mad. Mad to think I would lift a finger to help you. Mad to make this monstrous confession to me. What do I care what devil's work you are up to? It was suicide, Alan. Well, surely you drove him to it. So you refused. Of course I refuse. I will not hesitate to see you shamed. You deserve it all. I will not be sad to see you disgraced, publicly disgraced. How dare you come to me, of all men in the world, with this horror? I thought you would have known more about people's characters. Lord Henry Watson has not taught you much about psychology, no matter what else he has taught you. Ask one of your friends, don't ask me. It was my to Alan. I killed him. You have no idea what he made me suffer. Whatever my life is, he had more to do with the making or the boy of it than poor Henry ever had. Murder to God, Dorian. Is that what you're come to? I shall not inform upon you. It's none of my business. <laughs> Besides, without my stirring in the matter, you are sure to be arrested. No one ever commits a crime without doing something stupid. But I will have no part in it. Alan, you 
must have a part in it. Wait, wait a moment. Listen, Alan, only listen. All I ask of you is to do a certain scientific experiment. You go to dead houses and hospitals all the time. The horrors that you do there have no effect upon you. If you saw this man's body lying on a slab in your laboratory, you would not feel that you were doing anything wrong. No, on the contrary, you would, you would probably feel that you were benefiting the human race or increasing some knowledge of the world and gratifying human intellect. All I ask of you is to do what you have often done before, Ali. Indeed, to destroy a bottle must be far less worse than the customs you are used to. And remember, Alan, it is the only piece of evidence against me. If it is discovered, I am lost. And it is sure to be discovered unless you help me. I, I have no desire to help you. You forget that. I am merely indifferent to the entire thing. It has nothing to do with me. Alan, think of the position I am in. No, no, don't think of that. Think of the matter purely from, from a scientific point of view. You don't inquire on the dead things on which your experiment come from. Don't inquire now. I've told you too much of this, but I beg of you, Alan, please. We were friends once. Those things are dead, dead like sometimes. The man upstairs sitting at the table without the charge, you will not go away, Alan! Alan, I beg of you! If they discover what I've done, they will hang me for what I've done! Don't you understand, Alan? They will hang me! There is no point in prolonging this scene. I absolutely refuse to have any part in it. It is insane of you to ask me! You still refuse? Yes!
bar. Dorian Gray and the Duchess of Monmouth. Whatever could you two be talking about? The disappearance of Basil Hallward or the death of Alan Campbell? Alan Campbell is dead. Yes. He shot himself in his laboratory just this morning. His lab assistants say that he had taken out some chemicals for personal use, and that he'd been acting strangely ever since. That he'd killed himself before they could pass the secret from his lips. It's quite the scandal. I thought for sure you already knew. I can't say I knew anything about it, Henry. I haven't seen Alan in years. Well, I'm sorry to be the one to break it to you. Now then, what was I interrupting? Surely Dorian was telling you about my idea to rechristen everything. What nonsense you talk, Harry. I certainly don't want to be rechristened. Quite satisfied with my own name, and I'm sure Mr. Gray should be satisfied with his. My dear Duchess, I would not alter either name for the world. They are both perfect. I was speaking in much more broad terms. It is a sad fact, but mankind has lost its faculty of giving lovely names to things. I never quarrel with actions, my one quarrel is with words. The man who can call a spade a spade should be compelled to use one. It is the only thing he is fit for. Then what should we call you, Harry? Call him Prince Harry. I'm more inclined to call him the devil. <laughs> I will not hear of it. From the label there is no escape. I refuse the title. Royalties may not abdicate, Harry. My lady. You disarm me. Of your shield, Harry, not your spear. Oh, I never tilt against beauty. That is your error. Believe me, Harry, you value beauty far too much. How can you say that? I'll admit that I believe it is better to be beautiful than to be good. But on the other hand, no one is more ready than I am to admit that it is better to be good than to be ugly. Ugliness is one of the seven deadly sins, then. Ugliness is one of the seven deadly virtues, Duchess, and the seven deadly virtues are what has made our England what she is. You don't like your country, then? Oh, I live in it. You go well to me. Let us talk of someone else. Your distracted host is a delightful topic. Years ago, he was christened Prince Charming, and he hardly looks a day older than he did then. Don't remind me of that! If you insist, we won't talk about your ever-present beauty. Besides, decay fascinates me more. Then what do you think of art? A malady. Love? An illusion. Religion? The fashionable substitute for belief. You are a skeptic. Never. Skepticism is the beginning of faith. Then where are you? I won't say. To define is to limit, and my reputation depends on not limiting myself. Like all good reputations, every effect one produces gives one an enemy. To be popular is to be a mediocrity. Not with women. And women rule the world? Believe me, Harry, we women can't bear mediocrities. We love with our ears, just as you men love with your eyes, if you ever love at all. Seems really hard to do anything else. Then you've never really been in love, Mr. Gray. My dear Duchess, how can you say that? Romance lives by repetition, and repetition converts an appetite into an art. Besides, when one has lived, it is the only time one has ever loved. Even when one has been wounded by it, Harry? Especially when one has been wounded by it. What do you think of that, Mr. Gray? I always agree with Henry, Duchess. Even when he is wrong? Well, that Henry is never wrong. And does his philosophy make you happy? I have never searched for happiness. Who needs it? I only search for pleasure. And found it, Mr. Gray? Often. Too often.
can not seem to calm myself down. The, the consciousness is being tracked down, hunted and snared, overtaking me entirely. As indifferent as I am to life, I am still terrified of death. Reality is chaos, but there is something terribly logical in the imagination. In the common world of fact, the good are not rewarded, nor are the wicked punished. No. Success is given to the strong, belly are thrust in upon them. That's that is all. Besides, even if a stranger had been seen prowling around the house, surely my servants would have seen him. Had there been footprints in the garden, then the gardeners would have reported it. Yes, it is. Good in my fancy. Sybil Bain's brother has not come back to kill me. He has set sail to Australia with the guilt of nearly killing an innocent man, driving him away. Besides, he doesn't even know who I am. Nor could he ever really know who I am. The mass, the view, the safety. It has done no such thing. How did you get in here? Who let you in? Your servants were more than willing to let me pass. Mine isn't the only life you've ruined. You're wrong. I'm not who you. <laughs> what treacherous illusion is this? I am completely unhindered. Well, so this painting may bear even my most fatal mistakes. I, I don't understand. You wait! You're not sophisticated enough. No real man could be. But I am no real man. I have defied the laws of nature, lost by humanity! That painting of my soul is more real than I am. I have nothing to fear from you, but you, who now know my secret, have everything to fear from me!
This is the man I told you about, sir. The sailor who broke into the house last night. I recognize him, but who is this other man? That, my dear fellow, is a good question. He looks very familiar to me, but well, I can't say I recognize him. Be a good man and take a closer look. Master's favorite suit and all his rings, but it cannot be. Stranger things have happened in this city. Oh, I see now that I take a closer look that that shaky face certainly does resemble Master Dorian Gray. Go to the police, report this immediately. I need a moment alone with my old friend. First created, I simply had to have you. And now. Your mom. I don't think anyone will miss you now. 